I'm glad I know a man who can. I'm thankful tonight that we have a God who can do anything. Praise God. It's good to see you here this evening. Thank the Lord for his presence. We felt here this morning, and I believe he's going to touch us and help us again tonight. Will you stand as we go to the Lord in prayer? Remember those that are in need of God's healing touch. Brother uh, Griffin told me that they had to attend the funeral today, the reason they were not here, so pray for that family. Also, Brother Breyer, we continue to pray for him and for his healing. We have a request for Barbara Hammonds, who's having uh, chest problems, heart problems. I also want her church. Pray for him. God would touch him. He was in the hospital this past week. Also, Jeff Bremer, we continue to pray for his healing. And also, the Burns, continue to pray for Joni and Doug. Doug has surgery coming up on the 25th. Pray that God would touch him and be with him. And there's so many others that have asked us to continue to pray for them. They're healing. They're going through some health issues. We know that God's able to touch them. The Bible tells us that we can pray the prayer of faith. The prayer of faith will save the sick and the Lord will raise them up. We believe that tonight. How many of you have unspoken requests but lift of hands? Let's believe the Lord for these needs and pray for this service. Father, we thank you tonight for your wonderful blessings upon us today. Thank you for your presence we have felt. Thank you for the privilege we have to serve you and to live for you. We welcome you in this house tonight. We pray your glory would fill this place. Let us leave tonight rejoicing in you for the great and mighty things you've done. We ask you, Lord, to move upon all these that are afflicted, every hand representing a need. We ask you, God, to touch them even now as we pray. Let them feel your healing virtue, your delivering touch. Be with those, God, who are facing surgery, those that are going through great difficulty in their health. We ask you, God, to strengthen them. Help their faith to increase, that they'll believe upon your word and trust in you for healing and deliverance. We give you praise and honor and glory for all these things in the lovely name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. Would you take a moment now and welcome one another to the Matthews Church of God. We're delighted to have you with us tonight. There's a little Baptist church that was on the way on the way here. There used to be a sign on it. I, I don't know if the sign's still there. It used to say, what have you done for others lately? I would read it and I'd chuckle a little bit, you know. Then I think about Isaiah 6 and 8, which says, Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall, I, whom shall I send and who will go for us? And I said, here am I, send me. I think about how often we bellyache when the Lord gives us something to do because we ask him to do it and then it's not as easy as we think. See, he said that he would provide us with the tools, with the resources, with what we need to accomplish his will. He never told us that it would be easy. See, because when you start working for the Lord, what happens? The devil puts a bullseye on your back. He puts a bullseye on your back and he intends to make it as difficult as possible to do what the Lord has commissioned you to do. Revelations tw Revelation 12 and 12 says, Woe to you, O earth and sea. I had to remember it. For the devil sends the beast with, with wrath. Why? Why? Because he knows the time is short. If the devil knows that his time is short, then we as God's people should know that the imminent return of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is 
but at hand. And if, he, if his return is but at hand, then we should never give up. We should never stop working. We should never stop toiling. We should never stop tithing. Because at any moment, guess what? Any moment, he could return. It could be tonight. It could be tomorrow morning. It could be before you get home from church. Are you going to be right with God before that happens? Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Almighty, gracious, heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you once again for the wonderful opportunity to be in your house, Lord. Father, we praise you, Lord, for the move of the Spirit that we felt here this morning, Lord, and we praise you for what you're about to do. Father, I pray once again that you would take these monies, that you would use them to further your kingdom here on this earth. I praise you, Lord. I give you all the glory. I thank you more than anything else, Lord, for the precious blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, shed on the cross for the remission of our sins, Lord. And it's in his name and his name only that we pray and ask all things. Amen. Christ the solid.
go to the stone that the builders rejected. I run to the mountain and the mountain stands by me. The earth all around me is sinking sand. On Christ the solid rock I stand. When I need a shelter, when I need a friend, I go to the rock. When I need a shelter,
God. Do you know that name is powerful tonight? The devil starts to tremble when the people of God say the name of Jesus. When we come together, when we assemble together in the house of God, we come in his name. Because he said when we gather in his name, he will be in the midst. We pray for the sick in the name of Jesus Christ. We cast out devils in the name of Jesus. What a name, a powerful name, the name of Jesus Christ. Praise God. Thank you, singers and musicians. Thank you so very, very much. Just remain standing, if you will, for the reading of the word. I'm reading tonight the text I read this morning. I think it's worth repeating. Genesis chapter 13, verses 10 through 13. And Lot lifted up his eyes, and beheld all the plain of Jordan, that it was well watered everywhere before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, even as the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt, as thou comest unto Zor. Then Lot chose him all the plain of Jordan, and Lot journeyed east. And they separated themselves the one from the other. Abram dwelled in the land of Canaan, and Lot dwelled in the cities of the plain, and pitched his tent towards Sodom. But the men of Sodom were wicked and sinners before the Lord exceedingly. I want to continue with the message I began this morning on the seduction of Sodom. Would you pray with me? Pray God's anointing tonight. Father, we thank you for your precious presence that we feel here. Thank you for your loving kindness, for your tender mercies. Help us, Lord, to enter into that place of worship into your very presence that you might do with us what you will that you would help us our weaknesses, our lack our frailties Lord I pray for your divine unction and anointing tonight that you would touch your people Lord that you would bless in a great and mighty way we know that it's your hand that must be upon us we know it's your spirit that must move among us we know God we need your help we can do nothing apart from you let the anointing be fresh tonight. Let the word of God hit its mark. Let those that hear tonight, those that are watching online, those that may watch later, Lord, we pray the word of God would penetrate their hearts, that you would stir them and awaken us to the reality of your soon return. We give you praise and thanksgiving for everything you've done already, for what you're about to do, for it's in the lovely name of Jesus Christ we pray and ask it all. Amen. And amen. You may be seated. A great storm is coming. And violent winds will blow. Jesus said, if your house is not built upon the rock, your house will fall. You can tell when the storm is coming because of the clouds, because of the wind, because of the pressure that begins to change, the atmospheric pressure. There's a storm that's coming. You can see it from the dark, ominous clouds that are above us. You can see it because of the winds that are blowing, because of the pressure that is building. Just think about all the people who are unprepared for the coming of the Lord and for the judgment that's about to come upon this earth people in your life, people that you know, people that you are aware of, that are not familiar, or do not understand, cannot comprehend, are not aware of the judgment that is about to come. The things that are of God are spiritually discerned. The carnal mind cannot comprehend the things of God. A judgment when men and women will stand before God and apart from Christ, They'll be lost for all eternity, lost forever. In this city of Matthews or in the city where you live, I wonder just how many of our neighbors would survive. How many of our neighbors would be caught away in the rapture? How many in our families would be ready should the Lord come tonight? Did you know not even 10 Righteous people could be found in the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. Not 10 people could be found. Charlotte is the eighth fastest 
growing city in the country. The population is 2.2 million people. 120 people move to Charlotte every day. Fast growing. People coming into this area, moving into this area. I don't know what the population of Sodom and Gomorrah were, but Abraham could not find 10 righteous people in those cities. You wonder if Lot had tried to win people to God or after all those years of living in such a wicked place that he just simply grew weary with well-doing. There were no churches. There were no Bibles. There were no other Christians. So don't you know he grew weary? Don't you know it beat him down? His soul was vexed. He'd go outside the city, sit at the city gate to get away from all the filthy conversation of the wicked. Maybe the frustration of his efforts wore him down because you can get worn down from the pressures of life, the stress of life. I thought about Moses who as long as his hand was extended, as long as he held up the rod, the victory was being won, but he grew weary. He grew tired and his hands began to come down and the battle began to be lost. But thank God for Aaron and her that came alongside Moses and said, Moses, we'll help hold up your arms. We'll help hold up your arms until the victory is won. He had the help that he needed. He grew tired, but he had the help, somebody to come along and hold up his arms. When Judas Iscariot betrayed the Lord and committed suicide, the disciples looked out and they found a Matthias to take his place. There has to be somebody to stand in the gap and make up the hedge. Somebody's got to come out of the darkness, the shadows, out of the ranks and say, here am I, Lord, send me. Or Lord, what would you have me to do? According to Barna, in March of this year, a, a survey was taken. 42% of pastors have given serious consideration to quitting full-time ministry. That's almost half of pastors. Two in five pastors have thought about leaving the ministry. When you simply walk away from the Lord's church, your spiritual life comes into question. How can you walk away from the Lord's house, away from the Lord's work and the Lord's business? How could you walk away, just suddenly disappear? The first church we pastored, this was very unusual. I received a call from the overseer. He told me he was moving me to another church. And I said, when do I go? He said, this Sunday. I said, don't I get to tell the folks I'm leaving? Don't I get to say goodbye? He said, no, you're to report at the new church this coming Sunday. The people that I'd been pastoring said they got to church that morning and they said, the pastor has got a new car. They went in the church and they said, no, we've got a new pastor. You know, I didn't walk away of my own accord. I didn't leave of my own accord. I obeyed those that had rule over me. And thank God they don't do it that way anymore. But that was one time when I, was, I just disappeared without saying goodbye because I was under orders from headquarters to go to this different place. So why do you suppose uh, that uh, Lot procrastinated when it came time to leave Sodom? Why do you suppose that he lingered, that he waited and had to be escorted by the angels? They had to say to him, get out quickly. Get out of here quickly as you can. He had to forcibly be brought out of the city, brought out by the angels along with his wife and his daughters. And the Bible says this, it was the mercy of God, the mercy of God that he was brought out of the city. There is such a seduction in this world. And we're seeing more and more people being seduced into the world. We're seeing more and more people walk away from the house of God, walk away from their testimony, walk away from their relationship with God. They're being seduced into this world. It's going to take the mercy of God it's going to take the resurrection power of Jesus Christ to catch us away, to snatch us away, to get us out of this world when the rapture takes place.
We're not going to get out of here of our own will. We're going to have to take the power of God. It's going to take his power, his resurrection power, the same power that brought him out of the tomb is going to get us out of this world. Mrs. Lot disobeyed the word of God, the Bible said. She turned around with a wistful look. She looked about Sodom, thinking about leaving this city that she had become accustomed to, and she was changed into a pillar of salt. She had been seduced by Sodom. Jesus said, don't forget her. Don't forget Lot's wife. Remember Lot's wife. Remember what happened to her. There's a reason Jesus said that to us because of the seduction of this last day. Remember, don't get your eyes on Sodom. Don't get your eyes on this world. Keep your eyes fixed on Jesus Christ. Don't look to the left nor to the right, but run this race looking to Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. We see it. We sense it. We feel it. People are just going about their business. Business as usual, casually, nonchalantly, unstirred, unmoved. God help us to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ to be about our Father's business with urgency because we are running out of time. I said we're running out of time. The clock is ticking. The sands and the hourglass are running out. The tide is coming in. We are running out of time. Help us not to be silent. Help us not to be distracted by any number of things, but help us to stay focused on the work and the will of God. Matthew 10, 15, Verily I say unto you, Jesus said, it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city. The cities of our land today, the cities of this world today that have rebelled against God and sinned against God, it's going to be an awful day. The Bible talks about woe. You read about the woes in the Bible. That means overwhelming grief and sorrow and anguish and affliction and regret. The terrible woes, the terrible cries that's going to come from this earth. It carries the idea of impending judgment that's coming on the earth. The wrath of God is going to fall because of sin. This is serious. And we better take heed because the hammer of judgment is going to fall hard. Not even Sodom and Gomorrah reach the level of decadence that we see today. Thank God there's still a remnant. Thank God there's still churches that are interceding. Thank God for those who are, who are in the gap, making up the heads, those that are praying, those that are, that are seeking God. Thank God for the church today and the people of God. They're the only thing that's keeping the judgment of God at bay. The people of God, the Spirit of God, all praise God for believers who are praying and interceding. 2 Thessalonians 2, 7, for the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. Whether this, uh, this is the Holy Ghost, whether this is the church, it makes no difference. Thank God the Spirit is still here. Thank God the church is still here because as long as they're still here, there's still hope for the lost. But the door is closing. The day of grace is about to end and judgment is about to come upon this world. When the pandemic hit, you know as well as I do that people were afraid to venture out. It was like a twilight zone. It was like something in a science fiction movie. It was like something that, that we've never experienced in our lifetime. And millions upon millions of dollars were spent on sanitation, spent on wipes and sprays and ventilation and on uh, masks and all sorts of things. Everything, every precaution, people were afraid, they're scared of something that was unknown, something that never encountered before. But what happened, we got sanitized, but we didn't get sanctified. 
We got sanitized but not sanctified. We, we were so scared something was going to happen. There's people who are still not in church today and they'll still tell you they're afraid to venture out to any house of God. They're afraid to go back to the house of God. I'd be afraid not to go to the house of God. I'd be afraid not to make my way back to where the people of God are because in Sodom there is no Bible. In Sodom there is no church. In Sodom there are no righteous. But thank God in the church today we still have people who know how to pray who know how to get a hold of God when the doctor gives you a bad diagnosis you want somebody who can get a hold of God to pray for you you want the church to intercede for you thank God for the church and the love that God has given to us for one another instead of getting closer to God it has driven some people further away from God the test can be failed cause you to get further from God. They've lost the moorings and they drifted away. Several years ago, Robert and Glenda Lenning were fishing from their yacht off about four miles off the coast of Florida. Glenda decided to take a swim and she jumped into the water but soon found that the current had carried her too far from the boat. She screamed for her husband without thinking. He just dove into the water and swam to her. Then he soon realized the current was pulling them both out to sea. So he was a champion swimmer, but she wasn't. So they had a plan. He said, I'm going to swim toward the boat. I'm going to fight against the current. I'm going to do all I can to get back to the boat. And said, you save your energy, save your strength. You just float, float with the current. When I get to the boat, I'll come for you. He swam for six hours against the current. Six hours he fought the current. The boat was about to go out of sight when the tide turned. And he was able to finally make it to the boat exhausted. He started to search, but the sun had set. He couldn't find his wife. The next day, he contacted those on shore a search party began and they were able to find his wife alive. Miraculously, she was alive, but she was 20 miles out to sea. 20 miles the current had carried her. 20 miles she had drifted out the sea, out that far away from him. I wonder how many Christians have just simply been floating, just simply floating. And the current, the current of, of evil, the current of Sodom, the seduction of Sodom has caused them to get further and further and further away from the lifeboat, further and further away from the house of God, further away from safety. This is no time to be departing from the faith. This is no time to be drifting from the shore. This is a time to cling to the rugged cross. This is a time to hold on to the nail-scarred hand of Jesus Christ. Instead of seeking to be close to God, many are simply drifting away from God. James 4 and 8 says, draw nigh to God, he'll draw nigh to you. Draw nigh to God and he'll draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Instead of seeking to be spiritually cleansed and purified, instead of humbling himself and repenting, man has gone farther away from God. That's why we're seeing what we're seeing today. The rebellion, the anarchy, the, the ungodliness, the filth that's in the land. He has defiantly dug his heels into miry clay. He stiffened his neck and hardened his heart and seared his conscience and said, I'll live as I please. Instead of running to the cure, he continues to drink the poisonous waters of Sodom. He continues to delve into the things of this world. He's drifted afar away from God and followed the seductive sirens of Sodom. He's gone away from the preciousness of the Lord and the blessedness of the Lord. I don't know about you, but I don't want to be away from him. I don't want to drift from him. I love his presence too much. If I couldn't feel the presence of God, I'd be a miserable person. But oh, thank God, I feel his presence. How to receive the laurels. I feel his touch. I feel his blessings on my life. A woe is pronounced on the land because of man's rebellion against God. 
Jeremiah, the sins of Sodom are compared to adultery, lying, strengthening the hands of evildoers. Amos emphasized that they oppress the poor, they crush the needy, and they live for themselves. On top of all of this, he said they're haughty and they commit abomination against God. The sins of Sodom were grievous, grievous sins just as they are today in the land. Jude 7 says, even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication, going after strange flesh, are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. There were no, no restraints, nothing to hold them back, no morals, no scruples. They, they had no restraint whatsoever. They were driven by unbridled lust. They openly displayed their sins. Are we not seeing that today that people are no longer ashamed, but they parade their sins? That's what he said of Isaiah 3 and 9. The show of their countenance doth witness against them. And they declare their sin as Sodom, and they hide it not. The people of Sodom were selfish. They were lazy. They had no concern for others. Ezekiel said, Behold, this was the iniquity of thy sister Sodom. Bread, pride, fullness of bread, and abundance of idleness was in her and in her daughters. Neither did she strengthen the hand of the poor and the needy. Wickedness filled the land. What kind of, what, what was going on in this city? What, what, was, what kind of citizens lived in the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah? What were they like? Jesus said, that he was coming in a day like Lot's day. How we look and see what was going on in Sodom lets us know the signs of the time and when he is coming again. Luke 17, 28, likewise also, as it was in the days of Lot, they did eat, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, and they builded. They went about business as usual up to the very day of judgment. Do you see how deceptive sin is? Do you see how deceptive it is? People live in sin and they think they're going to be the exception. They think that it won't catch up with them. They think they can get by with it, but the wages of sin is death. There's going to be destruction to come upon a land that's filled with sinfulness and ungodliness. Something far more sinister was going on in the city of Sodom Something was happening inside beyond this casualness, beyond this business as usual. There was a, it was a city of confusion, a confused people. Confusion was there. The Bible said they gave themselves, they willingly gave themselves to uncleanness, to dishonor their bodies among themselves. Willingly gave themselves women and men defying the, the, the laws of nature, defying nature and burning in their lust one to another. Men with men, women with women, doing that which is shameful, indecent, and repulsive. Repulsive. What we're seeing today is the same seductive spirit of Sodom that worked in the city of Sodom, that worked in the hearts and the minds of people there. That's why we're having today drag queen story hour where the man dresses up in this outfit and begins to read to little children in the libraries, in the schools, and the bookstores, and they are applauded for it as tolerance and acceptance, as enlightenment. They, they embrace the sinfulness of Sodom. The LGBTQ uh, people have themes everywhere you turn. It's even in the comic books. It's coming into the cartoons because they want to indoctrinate the children. They want to steal away the children. Just about every TV show, every Every movie has an LGBTQ character. Jared, people living in sinfulness and ungodliness and they declare their sin as Sodom and they hide it not. But what is so shocking is how the church is falling under the same judgment of confusion as Sodom. We know better. I said we know better. We've been enlightened. We've tasted of the heavenly gift, the Bible says. 
We've been made partakers of the Holy Ghost. We've tasted of the good word of God and of the powers of the world to come. We are children of the day and not of the night. How could we fall to such deception? How could we fall in line with such as this and thinking that it's that is something that's being intellectual and something that's being sophisticated? It's an abomination in the sight of God. It's demonic. It's an attack against the word of God and the people of God and the church of God because the distinction between male and female is one of the most fundamental distinctions in the word of God. They reflect God's divine design because he is the divine designer. He created us as we are male and female. It's what, it's what makes civilization possible that you have male and female and procreation. You have the family unit. The demise of these distinctions will spell the end of civilization as we know it. A man that dresses up like a woman makes a mockery of the male-female distinction. Anyone who seeks to change the gender is trying to obliterate the distinction altogether. They say, oh, we don't like God's design. We don't like what God has done. We're going to change it. That's the devil. That's demonic. That's evil. Transgender ideology declares an all-out war on the male-female distinctives in the word of God. It is war against God. It's war against the people of God. It's the devil. It's antichrist. It's against the word of God. The current market for transgender surgery is $2.1 billion. And it's expected to go up to $5 billion by 2030. In all this chaos, in all this confusion, we're being told that men can get pregnant. When I hear these things, I always think of that scripture. They declare themselves to be wise, but they became fools. That's a fool. That's a fool that says a man could get pregnant. Instead of breastfeeding, we're told to say chest feeding so that we will not discriminate against man. That's a fool. That's a fool that says such things. We are told that now we need to embrace concepts of gender fluid, non-binary, and omnigender. That's foolishness. That's ridiculous. That's demonic. That's of the devil. We need to cry out against it. It's not, it's not something that we should turn our heads around and say, let's just ignore it. We need to stand up on the word of God. In the beginning, God created man and woman. In the beginning, God started it all. He wasn't confused. He's not the author of confusion. The devil's the author of confusion. He's the one that's turned everything around. Let us get back to the word of God and seek the face of God and he will heal our land. It's an assault. It's an assault on male and female as God created them. It's cultural chaos. It's madness driven by demonic spirits. It's a direct assault on God's design. It's Sodom and Gomorrah. It's amazing to me how that there's such a push to put people like this in office. Our tax dollars pay their salaries. Put people into office that don't know whether they're a man or woman and don't even know the definition of the individuals. It's Sodom and Gomorrah. Lot chose to live in Sodom. Why? Because it looks so good to him. It looks so prosperous. Well-watered plains of Jordan. The grass always seems to look greener over somewhere else. I was talking to a businessman recently and he'd been having some marital difficulties and uh, he was telling me things weren't going well. I've been trying to encourage him. And he said that the woman he's married to now seduced him away from his first wife. And after all these years, he said, I wish I had my first wife back. See, the grass wasn't greener. Wasn't greener. And he's passed that on to his child. His son is going through the same thing. You see it, you see it replicated. You see it reproduced. You see it happening over again. It was also a wicked area where Lot was in. He said the men of Sodom were wicked and sinners before the Lord exceedingly, exceedingly. 
Sodom was disgusting. It was immoral. It was ungodly. It was wicked. It was lustful. It stood for all that, that God hates as an abomination in the sight of God. It was so wicked. This is how wicked it was. That men of the city, the Bible said, both young and old, young men, old men, surrounded the house of Lot. What did they come for? They saw two men, angels in the Bible often appear as men. They look in a man form. And they saw these two angels they thought were two guests of, of Lot that had come to visit with him, maybe some relatives. And they were burning in their lust. They wanted these two men that they could have sexual relations with these angels of God. That's how wicked that's how far into the darkness that they had gone. They said, we want these men. This is a militant spirit. This is an aggressive spirit that's coming after our children, coming after our grandchildren, lustful desires that are burning that's not stopping. We hear it every day. We hear it happening every day. Somebody has disappeared. Somebody's missing. Somebody's been attacked. The things that were going on in Sodom vexed Lot's righteous soul every day. From day to day to day, it vexed his soul. There's something wrong with us. If we can live in Sodom and it doesn't vex our soul, something's wrong with us. If we're not disturbed by what we're seeing and hearing every day, it should grieve our spirit. And it's sad that many churches and many church members have been seduced by Sodom they become chummy with the world until they can sit around and sip cocktails and swig on a beer and tell dirty jokes with the best of them. There's something wrong when church people can get to that point. He said, come out from among the world and be separate from them and be holy even as I am a holy. Everything about heaven is holy. It's pristine. It's clean. It's glorious. And only the holy people of God are going to make it there. There'll be no sinfulness there. There'll be no tempter there. No devil there. Only the born again blood washed, redeemed of the Lord who've been washed in the water of the word, who've been washed in the blood of the lamb, who've been bathed in the love of Jesus, who've been purged by the fire of the Holy Ghost redeemed by the blood of the lamb thank God, I'm ready and I'm looking for his soon return Abraham could not find 50 he could not find 40 he could not find 30, he could not find 20, he could not find 10 righteous people in Sodom. They weren't there. The city was filled with people who were eaten up with lust and sin and ungodliness. We're living in a cesspool of evil. You feel it, you sense it, you have to fight against it every day. Every day, I'm fighting against it every day. I'm fighting, I'm praying for you. I'm fasting, I'm praying, I'm seeking the face of God. I'm studying, I'm staying in the word of God. But I need your help. I need you to hold up my arms. I need you to hold me up in prayer. I need you to stand with me. We're going to fight this thing together. When the enemy comes in like a flood, the spirit of the Lord is going to lift up a standard against him. We're going to snatch away from the hands of the enemy. We're going to snatch away our children and our grandchildren and our marriages and our homes away from the hands of the enemy. Victory is ours in the name of Jesus Christ when we come together where two will agree on anything as touching heaven. Any two will come together and believe together as you believe, as your faith is. So be it unto you. Praise God. Would you stand with me, please? God's judgment fell on Sodom and Gomorrah. Fire and brimstone came down from heaven. Archaeologists have gone to the Dead Sea. That's where they believe that Sodom and Gomorrah were underneath the Dead Sea. And they put down grappling hooks. And they could only retrieve molten sulfur, which is brimstone that has been burned. The city was reduced to cinders, to ashes. Jesus said the same day that Lot went out of Sodom, he rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Peter and Jude both tell us 
and turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them with an overthrow, making them an example unto those that after should live ungodly. He said, this is what's going to happen to the ungodly. Judgment is coming, and the Lord wants to deliver us from Sodom. I'm one of those that believes in the pre-tribulation, rapture of the church. I don't believe we've got to go through half of it or part of it. I believe he's going to get us out of here before judgment comes on this earth because that judgment is not for the church. He wants to get us out of here before destruction comes because sin always brings judgment. The only hope we have is the grace and the mercy of God. He said, get out, run to the mountain of God. We sing about that tonight. Get out and run to the mountain of God. It's time to get as close to God as you can. If you've just been floating, just been floating along, you're drifting away, getting further away. It's time to get as close to God as you can. Do what you have to do to get close to God. Would you come tonight? Let's spend some time praying because there might be people in your family, people in your neighborhood, people in our city that need the convicting power of God and we can pray for them. That God will convict them and stir their hearts that they'll call on the Lord to be saved. Let's pray. Pray for them. Pray for our families. Pray for our city. Pray for our church. Pray for one another. to trust. 